Okay, so the, we'll now have the third lecture by Professor Tim Dockchitzer. So please go ahead. Thank you very much. So uh, let's see. Uh, the last lecture, I um, spoke at the end of the lecture a bit about split and non split group extensions. So this is pure group theory. And um, in particular, I uh, mentioned, just gave you one example. Sorry, I think I lost my annotation tools. Just give me a second. Spotlight. Yes. Um, yeah, and I give you an example that there are four extensions of C2 by C4 um, to split to non split, or if you want to, where C2 acts on C4 with a trivial action and two when it acts by inversion. So all four possibilities are there and you get really four different groups here, which all sit in the same sort of exact sequence. And uh, this is closely, this problem of whether the extension is split or not, turns out to be closely related to what we've been talking about, which is an embedding problem. Uh, namely, uh, when you try to embed uh, an extension with Galois group Q, so think of Q being C2, into a larger Galois extension, which has this Galois group. So remember when you have one Galois extension containing another, that means that one smaller group is a quotient of a bigger group. Uh, then we've seen that sometimes this is possible, uh, this is not possible. Uh, so recall that for instance, uh, we've looked at which theorems that not every C2 extension, let's say of Q can be embedded in a, uh, into a C4 extension, let alone a C8 extension. There are um, obstructions to doing that. Uh, and similarly, uh, you cannot always embed a quadratic extension into Q8 extension, because if your extension is Q root D, then uh, from that width theorem, this D has to be represented by a form, which is sum of three squares. So numbers, for instance, minus one or seven, which are not uh, sums of three squares, um, the corresponding quadratic extensions can never occur inside a Q8 extension. So um, we say that the embedding problem is abstracted. And now it turns out that it's not a coincidence that it's these two groups here, C8 and Q8 in this list, for which the embedding problem is abstract and abstracted. And it turns out that when, um, when you have a split extension, so in this case, when you're looking at these two groups, so split extension of a group by, uh, by an abelian group, then uh, the embedding problem always has a solution. So you can always lift a Q extension to a G extension. So this is what I'd like to talk about. So I think this theorem was rediscovered a few times and it appears in different sources, which don't quite quote one another. But um, I think the first one who noticed this was Saltman and he proved this result here that if you've got um, G, which is a semi-direct product, so it's a split extension, A semi-direct Q, where, where A is a billion, then you can solve an embedding problem and lift any Q extension to a G extension, or let's say if you've got a regular, that's the case that we and P was also interested in, uh, extension with Galois group Q, let's say over Q T1 Tn, can be always embedded into regular G extension over the same basic. Uh, and um, I don't know a very explicit version of this theorem, unfortunately, that would be quite helpful and I put it as a, a research problem, but I do know an explicit version when um, the abelian group A by which you extend is cyclic. So let me give it to you uh, because it's very similar to the theorem that we had last time about how to construct cyclic groups in the first place. Uh, if you recall the way we constructed cyclic groups using Kummer's theory, we sort of said, well, if you want to construct a family of CN extensions uh, over the ground field, then you join N through to unity, then you take an arbitrary element of Q zeta N, uh, we call it a G, and then you look at its N roots, and then you hook up some sort of combination with roots of unity uh, and these N roots of these guys in such a way as to get uh, as to get the right Gala group. And it's exactly the same uh, thing here. So this is the generalization, if you want, of this construction, where you have an extra uh, Q extension at the bottom, because remember, we're not trying now to construct a CN extension, we're trying to construct um, a CN semi-direct Q extension. In other words, we've got already uh, this quotient, we've got a family here, and we try to extend it to a family here. In other words, we want to, we already have this field K, and we want to put a cyclic group CN on top. 
such that it has exactly the right action that we want uh, of this group Q. So here is a setup where we've got a finite group Q, that's our quotient group here. Uh, we have n greater or equal to two, which, which gives us the cyclic group Cn, and we are given a homomorphism, which completely determines in this context, if you recall, the split extension. Uh, it's some homomorphism from Q to automorphisms of Cn. So it's some homomorphism, and we are given uh, a Galois extension, let's say of Q or Q of T, it doesn't really matter for what I'm going to say, let's say of Q, and then we'll put them later in a family, um, of the rationals with Galois group Q, which is disjoint from uh, Q Z dian. Um, so the idea here that we kind of do exactly the same, uh, we adjoin n through to unity to K. So again, now remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to construct a cyclic extension of K with a certain property. So what we're going to do, we're going to adjoin n through to unity to K. Now this condition that K is disjoint from Q zeta n, which is kind of generically going to be always true anyway in any family, um, in any regular family, um, it guarantees that when you adjoin zeta n to, to K, you get again a um, extension of the same degree, the same Galois group Z mod N Z cross, and we can identify it with Z mod N Z cross exactly as before. We identify Galois group of K zeta n over K with Z mod N Z cross by saying that take an integer J, take a residue class in Z mod N Z cross, uh, and then the corresponding automorphism which sends n through to unity, a fixed primitive n through to unity to its jth power gives an isomorphism like this. And then we define, well, basically the same polynomials as we had before for Cn, except that there's a one little extra summation here, which goes over our uh, automorphism group on the bottom. So it goes over Q. So again, uh, this is going to be a polynomial of degree n, so it's going to have n roots. It's going to give this CN extension here. Uh, so it's a product of x minus something, uh, n terms. Uh, and this something is some combination of n roots of unity and n roots of uh, the following things. So again, I take an element, if you want a generic element, now in k zeta n. So it's this field where I join n roots of unity. And now on this field, I have two Galois actions. First of all, there is an action of this Galois group here, like I had before, which sends n roots of unity, uh, you know, to the jth powers. But also because uh, my k comes with automorphisms, it comes with an action of this q here. I can also mm -hmm. act uh, on elements in k, or if you want, in k zeta n by uh, by this group q. So there are two different actions: one by elements, if you want, of z mod n z cross and one by elements of Q. And so we take n roots of various things, so sigma j of Q of G for varying Q and varying J. So these are all possible n roots we could take of various conjugates of this element G. And we put them sort of cleverly together into one sum. And then it turns out that we have exactly the same thing as before. We get a polynomial with rational coefficients. And then for most choices of G, uh, it is going to be irreducible. And if you construct a field by adjoining roots of G uh, to K, then you get an extension, uh, which is a Galois, which is Galois, with Galois group CN, and uh, it is set up in such a way that it's also Galois over Q, and it's Galois group over Q is exactly as we wanted it to be CN similar and Q. It's just not very hard to check by just, you know, acting on its roots by various groups and seeing what, uh, what this action does to them. So this is how it works. Again, it's very explicit because you can do these computations very easily over the complex numbers, round to the nearest integers and all that. But this has also been implemented um, in, the, in the package as a function, which is called extension, which I'll illustrate probably in a second, uh, which takes a family uh, of Galois groups, um, family with Galois group Q, uh, it takes the group G, and gets a norm, it gives it, you give it a normal subgroup, which is cyclic of order n, uh, and then it lifts this family to, uh, to a G family. Okay, as usual, I'll try to watch chat in case you have, uh, have questions. So let me give you a few examples just to see kind of what sort of groups you can construct using these constructions. And it turns out that you can get quite far with it. 
So uh, let me start with small examples such as symmetric group and three lattice or dihedral groups. So let's start with S3. Uh, and uh, this is the one baby case of an extension problem because S3, you can call G, this is going to be my group. It has a C2 quotient. And this turns out to be, the, it turns out to be a, a split extension um, of the kernel, which is a cyclic group of order three. So remember again, if you S3 is a group of permutations of three letters uh, and even permutations, they form a subgroup, which is this one. Uh, and the side of a permutation gives a homomorphism to C2. And now, uh, first of all, it's a split extension, which is a general result, uh, which follows from this cohomology nonsense that we talked about last time, the sum group H2, which classifies these extensions, H2 of Q comma A. And if Q and A are co-prime, it turns out that um, this group is killed both by the order of Q and order of A, and it has to be trivial. So there are no extensions other than uh, the trivial one, the semi-direct product. And this is called the schulz assenhaus theorem. It says that when uh, you look at extensions of a group A by a group Q, and the order of Q is co-prime to the order of A, then every extension is split. There's one extension for every action. And in this case, this is therefore a split extension. So, uh, and it's a special case of what we now did because this is a split extension with a cyclic kernel. And therefore we know by this theorem of Saltman that every, uh, that the embedding problem is always soluble. So every C2 extension, you can embed an S3 extension. So that's a neat result, uh, which is, well, not completely obvious that every quadratic extension is contained in some S3 extension. In other words, you can always, for every um, integer d, cook up a cubic polynomial, which has discriminant d up to squares. So that the corresponding splitting field contains a quadratic extension q of d. And um, if you, you know, use this function here uh, and you see what comes out, uh, you say, well, let's look at the family, the obvious family of C2 extensions, just q adjoining uh, root a. So it's a family given by polynomial x squared minus a, and you ask for extension of this family to S3 over C3, and then um, what comes out then is this family here. So um, this is the family of S3 extensions, such as the discriminant of this polynomial up to squares is exactly a. So you can use it to construct an S3 extension with any given quadratic field inside. And it's well, automatically regular from, from these properties. That's not hard to see. And the same thing uh, you can do for arbitrary dihedral groups, of which S3 is a special case. So for example, the dihedral group Dn, it's also a semi-direct product of a cyclic group by cyclic group, uh, Cn by C2. And that means that, uh, first of all, you can realize it regularly. Uh, but secondly, again, um, you can embed uh, any quadratic extension Q adjoining root A in a dihedral extension. Um, such that um, the quadratic cutout by Cn is exactly um, the quadratic field that you want. And these families, again, you can construct in the same way, even though, uh, recall, it's the same problem as we had already with cyclic groups. When you construct them, even without any Q, the coefficients of these families, the size grows quite, uh, quite badly. So these are reasonably unwieldy families if you take N to be large. For example, D11 is pretty horrible. Uh, yeah, so that's the remark that I that I was going to make. Uh, on the other hand, um, in the book, for example, of Malé and Matsat and Inverse Galois theory, uh, they didn't have, even have a D11 uh, family at all because this was one of the groups that was just too difficult to construct computationally. And you know, now you can do it, even though the results maybe are not very pleasant to look at. Uh, okay, so that's uh, that's two examples. So um, now let's take a little bit of a deep breath and see. What is it that we um, that we've done? So in the last two lectures we constructed regular families for cyclic groups, and now from there it's quite easy to get abelian groups as well, because generally it's easy to construct direct products of two groups if you can construct regular families for both of them. Uh, for example, there is an exercise to do this carefully for C two cross C two, but the same idea works for arbitrary groups. Basically, if you take a family for C2, such as x squared minus a, 
and take another regular family for C2 in a different er variable, x squared minus b, then just taking the product of these two polynomials, it's very easy to see that it gives you uh, a regular family um, for C2 squared over QAB. Uh, this you can do for any direct product. And then Hilbert specialization theorem tells you that specializing uh, these things, one of these variables to, I don't know, specializing B to A plus one or something probably will give you a regular family in one variable if that's what you're after. So we can do cyclic groups, we can do a billion group, we can do direct products, and we have this new construction that says that if you can do a group Q, then you can do a semi-direct product CN uh, by Q, independently of N and independently of the action here, as long as this extension is split. And now if you look at small uh, non-abelian groups, you discover sort of um, some pleasure, I guess, that we've covered all of them, except sort of for one, which is the quaternion group, which I'm going to do next. Because if you look at small non-abelian groups, in this case, these are non-abelian groups of order less than 16, uh, well, all of them, except two, except Q8 and A4, turn out to be a semi-direct products like this, of a cyclic by, uh, by a billion, uh, as you can see here in the list. Uh, so there are only two groups missing, A4 and Q8, and A4, we already know, there is Hilbert's result on AN, um, and uh, you can also apply, even though, again, it's not maybe as explicit, Saltzman's theorem, because A4 is actually uh, a special case of it. It's, um, it has a um, normal subgroup C2 squared, which is a billion, uh, and uh, the quotient by which is cyclic of order three. And again, the two orders are co-prime here, so that's automatically a split extension. So um, Saltzman will also tell you, and so does Hilbert, uh, that uh, you can construct A4 regularly. So the only missing group here is Q8. And it turns out that, well, this, is, this group is not a semi-direct product of anything by anything. It's uh, quite easy to see because um, this group has um, subgroup plus minus one. So the elements in the Q8 are plus minus one, plus minus i, plus minus j, plus minus k. And this plus minus one has a property that it's a, a group, subgroup, which is contained in every other subgroup of Q8. So um, all the other subgroups generated by i, j, and k, they all contain it. And such a group can never be a semi-direct product because for semi-direct product, you need two subgroups, sort of a copy of your um, A and copy of your Q, one normal, one not, which have trivial intersection, and you can't do it. You can't do a trivial intersection as every, every subgroups contain the same elements, like plus minus one in this case. So this is not a semi-direct product, uh, but nevertheless, it turns out sort of interestingly that um, you can still construct it using exactly the same construction. Uh, so I'll, I'll do this next. So here's a question in order to apply Hilbert's reducibility theorem. No, uh, the family does not, to, does not need to be regular. So Hilbert's irreducibility theorem just applies in general. It doesn't need the word regular. Of course, then what you get is a family which is not regular. But if you're just interested in the inverse Galois problem over Q, that's certainly absolutely fine. Yeah. Uh, OK, so it turns out that Q8 um, is not in itself a semi-direct product, but it's a quotient of a semi-direct product. So it's a quotient of a group, which is C4 semi-direct C4 of order 16, uh, to which the theorem does apply, which is sort of quite interesting because many, often when you do this kind of inductive constructions, you say, well, you know, suppose I already constructed something for smaller groups, let me now do it for larger groups. In this case, if you want to construct Q8 using this theorem, you first need to construct a larger group and then take its quotient. So the class of groups that we're looking at, which are these kind of semi-direct products of things by CN, it's not closed under quotients. There are groups like this, which are semi-direct products like this, whose quotients do not, have a, do not have this property, which is nice for them because again, we can construct Q8 using C4, semi-direct C4. So let me uh, do it, so it's very explicitly, hopefully you don't object, uh, and show you, you know, how do you do this kind of in practice. So first of all, if you look, uh, let me just do it on the group names database for, uh, for Q8. So uh, this is the quaternion group Q8 uh, of order eight. Here is a lattice of subgroups, which I alluded to. It has a center, a plus minus one, and then three subgroups generated by i, j, and k, 
and then there's a whole quaternion. And here it is given by generates and relations. Um, and um, what I would like to look at here, I would like to look at what is it a quotient of. And if I look what is a quotient of, it gives, there is a list of groups of which Q8 is a maximum quotient. Uh, and in this list, there is this group of order 16, which is C4 semi-direct C4. So if I look at it, I don't have to look at it really, uh, except the fact that uh, I have to know how to produce it in magma. And in magma, this is a small group of 16 comma uh, four, because that's what, that's what this is. This refers to the small group database. Uh, it's a larger group. It's a semi-direct product again of C4 by C4. It's a group of order 16. Uh, you, can look at its, you can look at its generators and relations, uh, which tell you exactly you know, what it is. A and B are generators of the two C4s. And this tells you how one of them acts on another. It, it acts like, a, like, a di like in a dihedral fashion by inverting it. Uh, and um, um, yeah, thank you, Bjorn. Uh, and um, what I was going to do, oh yes, uh, you can see now that uh, this group has a um, subgroup, normal subgroup, which is cyclic of order two, such a quotient by it is, uh, is Q8. And that's the thing that I'm interested in. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to construct a family for this group here, and then take a quotient and construct a family for Q8. So let me try to do it kind of on the fly, even though people should advise against doing this life, but let me try to do it anyway. So here is our group. There's a small group of 16,4, which uh, Magma, I think, would probably refer to uh, the same name, C4 uh, by C4. It's some group of order 16. Uh, and first of all, um, to construct a family, I need to find the abelian subgroup in there, which I'll call A, which is C4, such a quotient, but it is also C4. So first, let me compute its normal subgroups. A bit, uh, convoluted in magma, unless you have a macro for doing this, which of course everyone does. Uh, so here is a list of uh, its normal subgroups, and I'm going to uh, select one from this list. Here is a list S of all normal subgroups of, uh, of C4 cross C4, by C4. I think there's five of them, or uh, I forgot, there's, there's quite a few of them, if I remember correctly, maybe even 11. Um, but I'm interested in a specific one. I'm interested in, um, in one of order four. So I want the order of this group to be equal to four. I want it to be cyclic. And I want the quotient by it to be cyclic as well. Um, it didn't give an error message, so I guess my assertion worked. So now uh, I've got a subgroup A, uh, which is some group, whatever, of order four, uh, which sits inside my group G and which has a property uh, that it's C4 and the quotient by it is also a C4. So now, as I mentioned before, there is this extension function, which lets me take a C4 family and extend to a family for this group. Um, so where C4 now refers to the quotient. So let me take a family for C4, for C4. There it is, this is a built-in one. Um, built-in family of C4 extensions. C4 is a first transitive group of order four. So here's my family. And I'm going to do, I'm going to extend this now using this semi-direct product construction to my group G. So again, this is my group C4 by C4 of order 16. This is my normal subgroup C4, which I found here. Uh, and uh, this is the family for the quotient group. And this is now hopefully going to be the family for C4 by C4. Okay, so it's given by some polynomial in X of whatever degree it found necessary with coefficients which are now uh, polynomials in A and this is a regular family. Uh, and now, uh, as I mentioned uh, before, uh, my group has a Q8 quotient, you can still see it here on the slide. Uh, so therefore inside the splitting field of this extension somewhere, there is a Q8 extension. So let me, um, let me find it by the same way. So let me redefine my G to be now the group of uh, this family. Uh, once it, one, when it constructed it, 
it computed some Galois groups and it probably redefined it to be a different permutation group than the one that I started with. So let me uh, redefine my G, it's still the same group as an absolute group. Again, uh, look at its subgroups, uh, which are normal. And now what I would like to do, I would like to find a normal subgroup of order two, such a quotient by it is C8. So let me do it again here. Let me, by the same assertion, uh, there exists a normal subgroup its list such that uh, its order is equal to two and the quotient is Q8. Well, I'll just go by group name, by quotient of G by M. And again, it exists. And now, um, so this subfield here, if you now go by Galois theory, so this group here gives you a Galois extension of degree 16 with this Galois group. And this uh, subgroup that I found of order two, it cuts out a quaternion extension. So what I would like to do, I would like to ask now for a subfield uh, inside my family, uh, which is cut out by this N here. Uh, and this is now a polynomial of degree eight. Uh, such that if I ask for a family defined by this polynomial, I find uh, a family of quaternion extensions. It's not the best family there is. Um, so it's, a, it's given by a polynomial of degree eight. And this is best possible because if I, I mentioned, I think in the first or second lecture that quaternions are one of those groups, uh, which although it has order eight, it only acts on eight points in the regular manner and, and on nothing else. So the smallest polynomial you can have for this group is of degree eight, but uh, it has quite large coefficients where large is measured by the degree in A. If you look for the best possible family, well, that I know of for the quaternion group, which I think is a transitive group of eight comma five, if I remember correctly, uh, it's again a polynomial of degree eight, but its coefficients you see are smaller, which is of course nice because if you experiment with these families, for example, you want to test some conjecture class numbers or whatever for quaternion extensions by plugging in a equals one, two, three, four, and so on, generating your quaternion extensions and then testing your conjecture, then of course you would like these coefficients to be as small as possible. And for that, they have to have um, smallest degree in a as possible. So normally you're looking for families of small degree, uh, which this particular construction is not particularly good at. But nevertheless, what I just uh, wanted to show you is that it is possible to construct Q8 essentially with the same construction, even though it is not a semi-direct product. So, uh, and I'll leave it as an exercise. I just put one um, to do it for Q16 uh, on, on the homepage, is that the same approach actually works and you can construct a Q8, Q16, Q32, and so on regularly with Salkman's theorem, or if you want explicitly, for any given sort of power here, like I did here for Q8 with a similar approach. And now this goes back to uh, one of the questions I think I was asked when I was talking about this embedding problem is that if you want to do it, let's say for Q8, Q16, Q32, can you formulate this embedding problem explicitly? Now, I don't know how to do this explicitly sort of for Q16, Q32 and so on, because these embedding problems, they, they do become, well, reasonably unwieldy. But interestingly, the, the approach which we now had, it avoids somehow, it magically avoids this embeddings problem completely. Because as we've seen, as you've seen in the construction of Q8, we never had to do any sort of abstractions. We just said, let's take C4, extend it to C4, uh, semi-direct C4, we can always do it. Of course, C4, I mean, the quadratic fields, for example, inside it, they're restricted and so on. So somewhere inside there, there are some abstraction problems hiding, but we never had to look at them in order to construct this group or even these groups here. So this is a very powerful approach. And you can ask yourself, how far can we get with this? What is the class of groups that we can construct by using uh, you know, the technology that we developed so far? So this class is called semi-abelian groups and it covers a lot and a lot and a lot of soluble groups. So I think it's a very interesting uh, one to mention here. So let me uh, do it now. So what have we done so far? So apart from SN and AM with Hilbert's construction, which let's take separately and let's not look at it. Uh, 
what we've done, we proved that we can realize uh, regularly over Q of T cyclic groups. What we've just did, uh, except maybe not always explicitly, but um, it doesn't matter as you will see in a moment if you're just interested in theoretical results, uh, split extensions A semi-direct Q when A is an abelian group and you know, Q already has a regular realization. So we can lift from Q to uh, A semi-direct Q. Uh, and it's also not very hard, even though I didn't talk about it yet, uh, to realize direct products and uh, what I mentioned very briefly, with products. Maybe I'll, I'll talk a little bit about them at the last lecture. Maybe not, I don't know yet. Uh, but I already mentioned that these things exist. Uh, so direct products is when you take two different Galois extensions, which are disjoint, and you look at the compositum. And with products is what happens when you put one on top of each other, one another. You start with a Galois extension, this group uh, H, and then you put on top of it a Galois extension, this Galois group G. Then generically, the group that you get is what's called the with product G with H. And um, it is um, not very hard to prove that if you can realize G and H regularly, then you can also realize G times H and G with H. And it is interesting because this is one of those examples where you do need regular and you do need to do it over Q of T. Uh, and there is one sort of cute examples where we don't know how to realize a direct product if you just do it over Q. There was uh, for a long time, the smallest simple group, which was not known to be realizable over Q, was a group SL2F16. And there's a paper by Bosman from just a year ago, really, uh, who proves how to realize it, uh, who, who constructs an explicit polynomial with that uh, Galois group. And, um, and from what I remember, he just proves using sort of complicated theory of Galois representations and class field theory that you can construct explicitly one example. So we have one example of SL2F16 field, but that means, for example, if you want to construct uh, an extension with Galois group SL2F16 cross SL2F16 over Q, then we don't know how to do it because you need two disjoint ones in order to do it. So it's a bit kind of uh, embarrassing, but well, that's, that's sort of how it is. Um, and similarly, just because you can construct it over Q, it doesn't mean you can construct it over any number field. For example, over the splitting field of the extension that he's con he constructed, we don't know how to construct an sl 2 16 extension. But if you have a regular family, that's all fine. Because basically by shifting X, if necessary, in such a way as to make the ramification low side of your extension disjoint, uh, you can always cook it, you can always set it up and generically it would always be the case that from two families with a given gamma group, the same group or not, same family or not, just by shifting the variable, you can easily construct direct products and with products. So these are the things that we can construct, cyclic groups uh, or more generally split extensions by abelian groups. Um, and if you wish, uh, with products and um, and direct products. And these constructions, if you ask what they generate, they generate a class of groups which are called semi-abelian, which are important in, in this Galois problem for, you know, for, for this obvious reason. Um, I don't know if anyone uses this terminology apart from people who work in in this Galois problem, but on the other hand, I don't think anyone else uh, uses the word semi-abelian anyway. So I think it's been reserved uh, in that context. So a few people looked at it and the terminology was coined by Matsat and then Denser and uh, Mikhail Stoll in fact, in one of his earliest papers, uh, proved uh, some uh, equivalent conditions for, uh, for this clause. So let me state it as a theorem by just putting all these together by Matsat, Denser and Stoll, that the following conditions on a finite G group G are equivalent. So the first one is really what we're asking now. What can we obtain in finitely many steps in a way as we obtain the quaternion group Q8 by taking split extensions of abelian groups and then daily quotients? So you start with a group which is just a trivial group C1. Uh, there's no point taking quotients in this stage. So after that, you say, okay, well, let's take an extension, split extension of this group by an abelian group. In other words, 
let's take any abelian group G1. If you want, you can take its quotient, uh, then extend it by another abelian group A2, take a quotient, extend by another abelian group, and so on, and proceed in this way. And if in finitely many steps you can you can get your group G, then this is called uh, this group is called uh, semi-abelian. And by Saltman's theorem, which remember proves that once you can realize a Q, you can also regularly over Q of T or Q T one T N whatever, you can realize a split extension by an abelian group. It follows immediately that uh, the inverse Galois problem, let's say over Q of T, which I call the script I G over Q of T, is true for semi-abelian groups. It just follows immediately from Saltman's theorem and this uh, generalis and this construction here. And then. Uh, conditions two and three are just um, well equivalent ways of, of doing this. So uh, second one says that G is generated by abelian groups, subgroups A1 up to AN. Uh, so far it doesn't say very much because any group is generated by cyclic groups. You just take every element, you know, and generates a cyclic group. So uh, that by itself doesn't say very much. But the, the strong condition that you want here is that you can order them in such a way that uh, aj normalizes ai for all uh, i less than or equal to j. Uh, and um, another characterization, which is in fact due to Nikhil Stoll, is that g is a quotient of an iterated with product of a cyclic group cm with itself. So it's a very neat, compact way of um, writing such a class. Uh, in particular, proving this theorem by avoiding um, Saltman, if you wish, because that's what he also did. It's quite easy to, again, realize cyclic group CM, and then you can also prove that you can realize with products, and by doing it repeatedly and taking quotients, you can construct, at least in theory, all groups like this, even though this approach, you know, this particular definition is not always practical, and, well, if you want to realize a specific group, you certainly don't want to do it in this way. In any case, a group satisfying these equivalent conditions is called semi-abelian, and for these groups, we do know the inverse Galois problem now. Okay, so here is a bunch of properties for, um, for semi-abelian groups. So first of all, uh, if you look at uh, any of these equivalent definitions, it's very easy to see that um, all semi-abelian groups are soluble, so uh, non-soluble groups def are definitely not covered by this construction. But otherwise, it's quite a nice class because uh, you see that it's closed under quotients, it's closed under direct products, it's closed under wreath products, basically from, uh, from definition. And uh, I, I didn't mention it here, it's also closed uh, by this construction of taking uh, extensions uh, of abelian groups. So every split extension of an abelian group by semi-abelian group is again semi-abelian. Uh, and there's a slightly more general version here. If you have a group G, which is generated by a normal abelian subgroup A uh, and a semi-abelian group U, then G itself is semi-abelian. And in fact, the converse is true that if G is semi-abelian, then it is generated by A and U, where U is strictly less than G uh, and uh, a and G is abelian, and this allows you to do sort of, this gives you this kind of inductive construction for uh, semi-abelian groups, and also a way to check if a group is semi-abelian. And then uh, there are people who work the inverse Galois problem, like people whom I mentioned before, like Thompson and Denser, they proved a variety of theoretical results that certain classes of groups are semi-abelian. So first of all, uh, if you've got a nilpotent group, what's called of class two, if you don't know what a class of a new potent group, it doesn't matter here, because this just means, um, in this case, that the derived subgroup of G is contained in its center. Uh, then such a group is semi-abelian. Uh, and um, if you have a soluble group, all of whose of subgroups are abelian, then G is semi-abelian. And then to show that uh, if you look at P groups, then for small powers of P, all these groups are semi-abelian. So in particular, the inverse gamma problem is true over Q of T for all groups here, for all groups of order P to the N, uh, where N is at most four, uh, and groups of order two to the five. So the quaternion group, for example, 
Q8 and Q16, they are uh, in this category here. Uh, so we know that they're semi abelian, therefore we could have predicted that at least for these two groups, uh, you can construct them with this, uh, even though they are themselves not semi-direct products uh, of anything, uh, they can be constructed uh, using this um, repeated construction of split extensions by abelian groups. And it turns out that semi-abelian groups, they cover a lot of ground. So if you, for example, look at uh, groups of order less than 64, there is 319 of them, that is quite a large list, and only five of them are not semi-abelian. Uh, and I listed them here. Uh, there, is a, there is a five of order 60, which is not soluble, and it's the only non-soluble group uh, in this list here. And remember, non-soluble groups are certainly not semi-abelian. And the other uh, five groups, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, I said five, I think there should be a six here, uh, unless I copied group twice, which I probably didn't. So uh, the other uh, five groups that you see on this list, one of order 24, and four of order 48, they are uh, closely related to the group SL2F3. So they all contain SL2F3 as a subquotient. So this in some sense is the smallest example for which this technology fails in a sense that it's a smallest example of the group, which you cannot prove it's regular over Q of T by this construction. You can take wreath product of cyclic groups with themselves as long as you want, take quotients, uh, take direct products, take wreath products, uh, and all these constructions will never give you a group SL2 three. So this is a very interesting example, and in fact, uh, quite fundamental for this list because all the others are closely related to it. And A5 will know how to construct anyway using Hilbert. So what I want to do in the last, uh, I think, eight minutes, if I know, if I'm careful with my, my time, is to talk about just this group SL2F3. Uh, this is a very interesting group for a variety of reasons, uh, not because of inverse Galois problem, but because it um, just uh, occurs everywhere all the time. Uh, in fact, um, from what I've seen, like the site group names, which I mentioned here, where I used C4 semi-direct C4, this is the group which is, uh, I think, gets mo the most hits on that website because most people are interested in this particular group for some reason or other. Now, I know it mostly as coming from elliptic curves. It's the largest automorphism group of an elliptic curve. And because of this, also, it's the largest possible inertia group that you can have in a Gala representation of an elliptic curve. And it occurs in many other contexts. And it also happens to occur in this inverse Gala problem as being a difficult group. So it has been observed that this group is difficult. So this paper by Smith from 1999, where he tries to construct families of Galois groups over Q of T for all transitive groups of degree at most uh, 20. Uh, sorry, uh, transitive group of degree at most eight. See, there's a question, what does equal 20 means? Uh, sorry, can you? Oh, I'm sorry, you mean this one. That's not a 20, even though it looks like a 20, it's a 2-0. It's uh, people in crystallography, uh, they have a standard notation for symmetry groups of platonic solids and rotations of platonic solids. Uh, and this, this specific group is, is called 2-0 in their, in their terminology. Uh, thank you. Uh, all right. So, uh, so he tried to look at um, transitive group of degree at most eight, and this particular one, uh, he did not know how to construct a regular family, uh, and he comments on this. That there is quite a lot of research, there are several papers uh, at that time written on uh, this specific group, uh, and uh, despite that, uh, no explicit polynomials giving a geometric extension of Q of T uh, seems to be known, which is kind of interesting, because if you look, for example, on LMFDB, if you, and if you look at number fields which have Galois group SL2F3, there's quite a lot of them there. And it's just a question, you know, how to fit them into a family, but that seems to be quite difficult. So it's a very uh, interesting group. Uh, and so let us, um, like, to be honest, in the same year, 
I think the book of Malay and Matzat came out and they do have a family for SL203, even though they don't say where they got it from, um, whether they just, you know, fit from a database or where they had some sort of a more a conceptual construction. But I know of one construction which does work and I would like to explain it here. I'll probably can't do it in, the, in five minutes, but at least I'll start it. And the reason it's interesting is that if you can do the same sort of thing for general soluble groups, I think you could get quite far in getting soluble groups uh, over Q of T. Okay, so uh, the way most people and uh, the wheels are going to think of this group is a semi-direct product of Q8 by C3. So it's again a semi-direct product of a group by a group, but in this case, this group here is not a billion, and that makes uh, all the difference. So um, it's a semi-direct product of Q8 by C3, and nevertheless, what we're going to prove that in this case, you can solve the embedding problem and lift any C3 extension to an SL203 extension, and along the way, construct a regular SL203 family. So how do you uh, see this? So the quaternion group, let me just now for once list all its elements. It's a group of order eight. The, its elements are plus minus one, plus minus i, plus minus j, and plus minus k, where the defining relations are that this i, j, and k, uh, they have order four, they square to minus one, minus one, one is central, commutes with everything, and um, you have the relations i, j equals k, k, i equals j, and j, k equals y, which I'm sure you've seen before. And if you've seen this before, you must have observed that this group has an obvious C3 symmetry, that you can permute i, j, and k cyclically. You can't do an arbitrary S3 permutations because you cannot swap i, j uh, with one another that ruins this relation here, but a cyclic permutation preserves the group structure. In other words, this group what is what's called, has an auto outer automorphism of order three. So there is an obvious, um, uh, automorphism action of C3 on Q8. Or if you wish, there's an obvious homomorphism from C3 to automorphisms of Q8, where a generator of C3, let's say, permutes i, j, and k cyclically. So there is a map phi, let me call it phi, from C3 to automorphisms of Q8. And that means that we could construct a semi-direct product of Q8 by C3 using this action. Uh, this is not how you define SL203, you can see here from the name, it's, it's defined as a group of matrices. It's a group of two by two matrices over F3 of determinant one. Uh, there's three to the four matrices over F3. Uh, 48 of them form a group GL203 of determinant uh, plus minus one, and half of them, uh, 24, have um, determinant one. So that's how this group SL203 is defined but it has this structure here. Okay, so inside it, it has a quaternion group of Q8. Inside it, it has three um, subgroups uh, generated by I, generated by J, generated by K. Inside it, it has plus minus one, which is in fact central for the whole group. And inside it, you have identity. So again, in Q8, these three are indexed two. they are normal. They are not, um, you know, they're pre preserved by conjugation, but in SL2 of three, where you have this extra element of order three, which permutes, which acts uh, on Q8 by conjugation, this i, j, and k are permuted. So these elements here are permuted by conjugation by an element of order three. And so uh, let me just end here by Galois correspondence. This is now what we're after. So let's take this picture and put it upside down because that's what Galois correspondence does. Um, maybe I should have put this picture upside down, then I would preserve. Um, the inclusions, but I didn't. Uh, so uh, this is the tower of fields that we're looking for. This, for some reason, has disappeared, should be a little k. So this is the base field over which we're going to work. Then we're going to take an arbitrary C3 extension uh, of little k called capital K. And then on top of it, we're going to try to construct a quaternion, ex quaternion extension using width result and what we know about quaternions and some extra input that we'll need in such a way that the three quadratics that we that will have along the way will be permuted by this C3 action. And this will guarantee that the total extension that we are going to get uh, is going to be an SL203 extension. So it will require a little bit of work, but in the end, it will uh, we will end up with an SL203 family like this. Okay, 
I think I just ran out of time, so it's probably a, a good time for me to stop here. Okay, thank you for the great lecture. Please. Are there more are there more questions? I'll watch the chat, otherwise, if you wish, you can ask them live. Is there a sense in which most solvable groups are not semi-abelian? Uh, so I, I'm not sure about this. It's quite possible, in fact, that most soluble groups are semi-abelian, because if I remember correctly, this new potency class two, uh, it's quite possible that, no, almost all oh. groups are no potency class two, just oh. because. You know, there are all two groups and in two groups. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think you're, I think you might so, be right. Yeah. It kind of okay. depends a little bit how you count because I think mm -hmm. saying that most finite groups are nilpotency class two, so it can prove something for them. We're almost there. This is completely misleading. So, um, so I'm not, I, I'm not sure how to point, how to quantify this. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, are okay. these all subgroups of SL two F three? No, because there's set, because this is a center, and there's definitely uh, a cyclic group of three in there. Which, by the way, I can't even see here. This so in this so uh, okay. Uh, let me just uh, show off where is the website. Uh, so. Um, here is SL two F three. So if you want a lattice of subgroups you will see that um, it's almost a whole lattice of subgroups. So this is a lattice of subgroups which I've drawn, uh, center, three conjugate now subgroups of order four, a Q8 and SL2 of three. So the only thing missing in this list is that there is a cyclic group of order three, which is three syllab. Uh, it's not normal, certainly, otherwise this whole group would be a direct product Q8 by C3. So there are four conjugate C3s, and you can also take them and enjoy the center plus minus one, and then you get cyclic group of order six. So incidentally, these are all possible uh, inertia groups you can have at p equals two if you look at the elliptic curves. Um, again, or to, yeah, uh, because again, this group, that's, that's how this group occurs. Uh, okay, I see there's an announcement. Uh, Though this social session today, probably right after this lecture, starting in 10 minutes on Zoom. It's very nice. And is there a magma code to do extensions by abelian groups as well? No, but there's a problem on my list of research problems which asks to do that. So uh, I don't know an explicit or so a very explicit analog of the theorem that I've given for cyclic groups for abelian groups, only when this abelian group is in. Uh, is an F2 vector space. I have a version of this. It must exist, and it's sort of alluded to that it should be possible by the people who prove this result, but I haven't been able to do that. So if anybody knows how to do that for general billion groups, I would very much want to hear that. Okay, is there a nice geometric interpretation of the wreath product? Well, apart from the fact that, you know, if you have a cover with Galois group G and on top of it, a cover with Galois group H and the whole group uh, is expected to have that cover, G wreath H. So for example, D4, that's your typical example of a wreath product. You take a random quadratic extension of Q, you join a square root of, I don't know, I, then you take a random quadratic extension on top of it, adjoining square root of three plus I, hopefully that's not a square. Uh, and then you're going to get a D4 extension like that. It's a wreath product of C2 by C2, but I don't think I can say anything more than that. No, I do not know. I mean, maybe this is not the kind of geometric interpretation you want, but you, I mean, it acts on a, the wreath product acts on a tree. So you can describe it that way. No. Um, yeah, I can, anyway, we can talk more about that later, I guess. All right, so let's see. Any other 
question. So let's see, there are, I guess, is that all? The, I think that's all the questions. Um, I think that's all the questions, yes. So, all right, so let's let's end here then. And there's this, I guess, yeah, so go ahead and join the social social meeting if you want. Uh, and the next the next talk is is a, is in about an hour and 15 minutes from now. So uh, Kristen Lotter will give her next talk. Okay. So um, yeah, all right. So see you see you later.